Uh, I have been hearing reports that in Colima there was moderate to heavy damage. Do you have any details on that at all? No, I have no direct no. reports. Okay. It's yeah. uh, consistent with what the seismology says because the uh, as you show in that map right there, where's the likely source of damage? The places where it's orange are levels that have, uh, sh that's intensity eight shaking, which is like the worst we had in Whittier Narrows. It brought, you know, killed people and brought down uh, buildings in, in Whittier at the time. It's like the level of shaking in Sherman Oaks in um, the Northridge earthquake. When you go out to the yellow, that's intensity seven with bad buildings that can still be doing damage and uh, even bringing them down. So it, it looks like, uh, if I look at the USGS report, it says that there were 27,000 people exposed to at least intensity seven shaking. And that is the level that would be, uh, um, that, that does a lot of damage, especially to poor constructed buildings. Well, and, and again, it's up to seven, six now. And Dr. Jones, we, we mentioned this before, your reaction, September 19th is a day that's had two earthquakes and they an hour before this quake they'd had a nationwide earthquake drill that is such an odd coincidence it is an odd coincidence our equivalent is june 28th okay. on june 28 we had the magnitude 6 parkfield earthquake in 66 the 5.8 sierra madre earthquake in 91 that killed one person and then the um landers earthquake the magnitude mm -hmm. 7.3 occurred on the same day in in um in 1992. So, you know, it's the, it's like uh, if you have 30 people in the room, probably two of them share a birthday, you know, because just because you, you have a lot of days to choose from and two people end up lining up. The same sort of thing for for this type of equivalent. You There's no physical reason that they should be uh, coincident, but you have a long enough duration, you're going to find some place where this is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jones, we initially uh, heard reports that the quake hit out, uh, off the coast, so in the water, and then it was moved uh, to on land. Okay, re let's remember that an earthquake this big doesn't happen at a point. Okay. Yeah. It happens, point. well, all earthquakes happen mm -hmm. over a surface, but if it's a small earthquake, that surface is small enough you can think about it as a point. Mm -hmm. An earthquake of this size at 7.6, the fault's going to be at probably at least 100 kilometers long. And therefore, and, and it's not just one direct, it's not just the link, it's also going to be the, um, the, the width of it. And so it's going to be on a, a plane that dips shallowly under the uh, coastline and the earth one side moves up and over the other. And so that means that probably where the fault actually breaks through to the earth's surface would be underwater and therefore there would be a tsunami watch at least because you're going to probably have changed the shape of the seafloor with this event um it at only 7.6 it's not so big that you don't um uh that you would you know it's not going to cause damage in in japan but it could very likely be causing damage locally at, at this size and, but then you've got a surface, so it would extend back in under the ground as well. So the people on land right at the coast are on top of the earthquake, as well as the place underwater where the fault breaks through to the surface. Yeah. Well, and some of the areas near, nearby, just to point out, Siwatenejo and uh, there are other um, tourist destinations, Manzanillo as well, those lots of, uh, lots of tourists in those areas. So to your point that this is an area that's likely heavily populated is also, uh, uh, you know, concerning. Yeah, though, though by the time you get out to Colima, it's intensity six damage, according to the, the very first estimate from the USGS. This could this could shift. It could have been intensity seven in Colima, I think. Um, but then the, the really bigger places like Guadalajara, uh, it's only intensity four. Very scary, but limited damage. Well, and, and you mentioned 27,000 <coughs> people likely exposed to the the most intense shaking isn't that the, the right. number you gave us yeah 27,000 at intensity seven which that's still a lot of people but it, it if if this was in it's mexico city millions. or something like that yeah. it could have been significantly right. worse right. So, and, and i mean it, the, the equivalent number for northridge as a comparison would have been several million people right because we put it right in the city. This at least is not as densely populated as that. Right. And then, so for those who may not r truly understand what a magnitude seven quake feels like, can you describe it for us? Or might well, the feel biggest like? difference between the, what it feels like depends on where you are with respect to it. 
You know, if you're in Mexico City, you would have had a really long duration shaking. It'd be scary, but it wouldn't have been bringing anything down. If you're right on top of it, when you're receiving the strongest shaking, um, it, it, you could be thrown in the air uh, from the intensity of the shaking. Um, the way you can tell the difference, though, is really the duration. Because remember, I said that the length of the fault is determined by the magnitude of the earthquake. So a magnitude of an earthquake, it's a fault that's 100 kilometers long. You have to start the shaking at a point, and then you know it's like you're ripping a piece of paper, and it takes time for that rip to travel up the fault. So it, it, for that size earthquake, you'd think that it would probably last about 30 seconds, maybe a bit, maybe more. Um, exactly depends on where the epicenter was and which direction it all traveled. Yeah. Um, and and that means that the shaking you're perceiving is going to approach a minute. You know, so you have 30 seconds of generating strong shaking. Northridge, we generated strong shaking for seven seconds. Wow. So this would just, the big earthquakes last for a much longer time. That's the biggest difference you feel. Well, and, yeah. and to your point of so many people feeling different levels of intensity, that unease yeah. is also something that, for me, is always a big thing when you don't know what you're feeling. Am I feeling the end of it? Am I feeling the beginning of something? Am I over the top of it or where? And we're showing video right now, which I, I, I can't, uh, our, our director and producer can't tell me exactly where that is, but it's some of that shaking was somewhat mild. Uh, you're looking at, so this could be from Mexico City. We don't, I don't have context if they could tell us where this was. Um, this, this wouldn't surprise me that it's Mexico City because uh, it's not that strong shaking going on. Right. Yeah, uh, people are walking around notice. shooting video. I can't imagine that is the. Right, uh, he's standing up. Yeah, if, right. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, if he and, was at the coast, he wouldn't have been standing. Yeah. And I, I think it's a really important difference to remember because, you know, we feel like, oh, I've been through a big earthquake. I was so scared by that. But, and your, my house was fine. You know, if you're in Chatsworth, you can say, okay, my house has been through really bad shaking. If you're in La Mirada, you can't. And, and so we need to remember that context that what you feel isn't just the magnitude. It's that intensity number that really tells you what to expect in terms of damage. And so now is a good time sort of to uh, remind our viewers that we are living in earthquake country. So if you wouldn't mind, again, uh, you know, sharing all of the uh, the advice that um, we we need to hear. Right. Yeah. We are never we at least in Southern California, we aren't going to get a tsunami. We don't have this type of subduction zone here, but we do have the San Andreas. We could easily have this large an earthquake. We could have shaking that goes on for a couple of minutes. So. Um, we have our seven steps to earthquake safety. Just search for that on the web and you can find some really wonderful advice. There's an earthquake country alliance that provides a lot of information. And, and I'd say if you haven't done anything, start by talking to your family and your neighbors and figure out how you're going to help each other because that's going to be the most important thing after the big earthquake. Well, and Dr. Jones, along with the information you just gave, I can tell folks that if you go to abc7.com and click on today's story with this particular earthquake, the 7.6 quake, then scroll down right there at the bottom of your screen, how to prepare for an earthquake. So this is one of those moments. Go. We talk about it all the time. When this happens, go through your checklist, make sure you know what to do, what you need, and uh, to be prepared. Yeah. And talk with people about it, because together you're going to do a better job. Yeah, and real quick, before you go, what is the next steps, in your opinion, uh, do you think, in, in Mexico for this? Well, right now they're at the stage of just trying to figure out what's really going on. Where are the downed buildings? Uh, the first few hours is when you can rescue people from trapped buildings. You know, we did have an earthquake in Taiwan over the weekend as well, and they, you know, people trapped in buildings, you get them out within the first few hours, it's a lot better than if they're stuck there for a day or two, then you really start losing okay. lives that way. Dr. Right. Jones, thank you very much for joining us. We'll have much more on this for Eyewitness News at 3 o'clock. For Javon Alara and Philip Palmer, thank, thank you for you. watching Eyewitness News at 11 a.m.